I'm going to talk extra loud and booming so that we understand that uh, he's ready to come up. It is the future kitchen, emerging kitchen technologies. It's, pan it's a moderated by the guy who brought us all here today, Mr. Michael Wolf. Uh, and he's going to be speaking with a couple people. This will be a lot of fun. Please uh, welcome Mr. Michael Wolf and his next panel to the stage. Just no, the three. Yeah. Gotcha. Inner pocket. I'll turn it on. In All right. Seconds. All right. We good? All right. Hey, well, guys, I'm excited about this. We've been uh, talking about some really interesting things this morning, and um, but I think let's talk about some of the things like core cooking technology and how things change and get a little bit nerdy on this panel. You know, I had a, a pre-call as I have, with, have had with all of my panelists, and uh, one of the things uh, that I thought intrigued me, by the way, we have Nikhil from June, we have Dan Visa from Freescale, and Indranol from Microsoft. That's the, I just want to introduce you guys. Nikhil, one of the things that you, you said that really intrigued me was the, that where the kitchen's different is, it's a place where you make things. It's like your factory. And so when I think about how technology needs to change, um, it seems like maybe you could maybe unify that. So talk a little bit about that concept. Absolutely. So um, one of the concepts we think about really hard at June is kitchen is the only room in your home where you actually manufacture stuff. The rest of your home is meant for consumption. You're consuming media, food, um, you're sleeping. Um, but kitchen is one of those places where you need the tools to do your work better. Um, to get efficiency and you need a good supply chain. Right now the supply chain is you driving to a safe way and picking up food and coming back, but that slowly is changing, right? So it's the Instacart, the Amazon Fresh of the world, which helps reduce the friction when it comes to the supply chain coming in your factory. So in the future, you can imagine that just-in-time delivery of ingredients combined with smart and intelligent appliances which help you cook them the right way, um, excellent walk-through recipe apps that show you exactly how to prep them. So that becomes a closed loop. Right? So that's, that's the future that seems exciting. But what, the one thing I, I, I don't understand when we look at that future, at least today, because I think we have a lot of islands and disparate kind of silos in, in the, in the, both in the home as within the kitchen, what is the framework that brings all that together? I mean, it seems like obviously software is going to play a big part, but I mean, I, as an industry, have we really even started to kind of scratch at that? Indra and all of you, as you think about the vision that, that Nick, Nick Hill has talked about, do you see, are we even within shouting distance of that at this point? Um, so, um it's still uh, in the phase of development. I think what we are seeing is um, individuals as they start developing their own personal preferences within the kitchen. Kitchen as such was basically providing a way how as an endpoint of a food that you consume and you do that. But what we are seeing over the period of time now, that kitchen is becoming the center of a social activity where people share ideas and able to cook together and do different things. And so within that context, when we start thinking about what that activity might mean by trying to, let's say, bake or trying to cook something very specific, the supply chain associated with it will start fitting in. And so you will start ordering the right kind of product, product just in time, which is going back to uh, Nikhil's original point. Um, and we are seeing the evolution of those slowly happening as it progresses. Nikhil, as you think about creating this vision of kind of these different parts of the ecosystem, the value chain from, you know, like the farm to table analogy, like from a smart kitchen perspective, farm to table is like how we understand, it, you know, we source it from Amazon, it, you know, it gets it, I store it in a, a certain place, I cook it, and I, I get all the data during the whole time. It doesn't seem like we're close to that. Are you seeing or thinking about the technology that makes that happen? Well, going back to your point, it's, it's software. Right. In the end of the day, it's going to be software and a mobilized workforce which works on demand. Um, you can see the effects of that with Lyft, Uber, 
all these on-demand services which have made the just-in-time delivery a reality. Um, there's some questions about the business model of that being effective in the long run, but I feel with technology you have the option to find the efficiencies. Um, for example, Instacart has this really brilliant model around having shoppers which do your shopping, but they have a separate fleet of drivers which actually pick up the food from the shoppers and drop them off in your home. So you see these step functions in efficiency across the food chain. And someday this farm to table thing could be doable. Right? So imagine CSAs which deliver more often or almost on demand where you can have a recipe app which basically instructs the, the grocery store to prepare a portioned sample of what you plan to make in the next two hours, get that delivered to your home, um, use Yumly or one of those really nicely done recipe apps to execute that um, and put that in a smart device which cooks it to you for perf to perfection. Nikhil and Dan, you guys are doing some really interesting things. You're both rethinking the way the cooking box in our home works. Uh, Nikhil, you guys have put cameras uh, in. If you don't know this, Nikhil is one of the key guys developing uh, the camera technology for, I for the iPhone. Um, Dan, you guys are putting RF cooking, the same stuff that's in our cell towers and our phones, using some of this technology to, to help us cook our food. And you're re re let me ask you, Dan, you're rethinking how this cooking box is going to work. You may have microwave technology, RF technology, convection oven technology, all in one box. You, you have this proof of concept, I think it's called Sage. Talk about that and how that can maybe be realized over the next few years and come to market. Yeah, sure. So I think what both June and Freescale uh, independently are, are working towards is a different way of implementing uh, things that in the electrical engineering world we're, we're all very well familiar with, which is uh, closed loop systems. And so a closed loop system is really uh, just a, a, a collection of a couple of simple principles. You know, can I deliver something? Can I measure or monitor what that thing is that I just delivered? And then can I make a d decision using algorithms, software, et cetera, about what to do next? And so our form of that is uh, using RF energy uh, generated by a semiconductor device implemented in a, in a circuit uh, that I can uh, control how much power that we can deliver, uh, how much uh, power is being consumed by the food that is uh, heating, and then make deterministic uh, decisions about what to do next based on that information. In the June oven, uh, they take a very similar approach in the abstract, but they use different uh, means by which to create the heat or the energy to perform the cooking, and they use a different uh, type of sensor or measurement system to determine how far along it is. And with either of those two approaches, you know, that they, they can help satisfy the, the need to um, improve the quality of the food that's being cooked by not overcooking food and thereby eliminating one of the largest uh, sources of loss of moisture and nutritional content. But it also makes for a very consistent outcome. And because it's based on, um, you know, contemporary computing methods, uh, you also have adaptability and the ability to implement machine learning capabilities so that as you have, you know, the normal variations in uh, food, whether it's, you know, the sources of the foods or the quantities of the foods, or maybe even it's the, the, the time of year in which uh, foods are being uh, sourced or, in, or, or taken out of storage and, and cooked, that the machine itself can adapt to those conditions. Yeah. This, you mentioned machine learning. I want to hone in on that a little bit because I've seen this theme uh, being explored across a number of different kind of uh, ventures in the, in the smart kitchen. I think what you guys are doing, um, I think Apple made an acquisition maybe about uh, a month or two ago. They acquired a company doing some really interesting things in machine learning, and I speculated what they may be doing in the kitchen. Um, in general, when you look at uh, machine learning and, and, and how that's applied to the kitchen. How critical is that in terms of like realizing this future we're talking about? Is that going to be a core competency and, and a technology that you're going to have to see a lot of these guys uh, yes. use? Yes, uh, actually at many different levels. Um, I think we look at it um, just like I was talking about the, the basic context of understanding how the cooking process and uh, adjusting to it uh, being one of them. Um, 
some of it could be very simple uh, algorithmic way of approaching it, but machine learning allows to improve over a period of time based on individual's preferences. And that learning capability is an important construct over here because people don't eat the food same way, every individual, they eat differently, they cook different way. And I think that becomes part of that, creating that quantified self, being able to take all of those data and creating a profile of what my patterns are and be able to create, whether I eat more sugar, less sugar, more salty, more rare versus you know medium, and all of those things becomes part of the core component and understanding of that whole thing. That's one part of it. The second area where we see is being able to manage and monitor the core aspect of the device itself. That means being able to provide that uh, the, 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 the concierge aspect, like from a vendor to the consumer, keeping him happy about the device that they purchase, being able to service and support that, is the other area. That predictively understand when things will work, when things might fail, and being able to support that. And we are seeing more and more of those becoming part of it. And I know, uh, Nikhil, you talked about the, the, the imaging, intelligence associated with imaging, or with video analytics and things like that they all become part of the core component as we see for the future how many of these technologies would be used inside of devices uh, within a kitchen uh, from a video perspective and other things. Envision the, the, the stove 10 years from now. Um, with, I think someone mentioned earlier is a 10-year replacement cycle. That's one of the things we're working against as we move towards newer technologies and why I think retrofit's important. But when you envision the stove tech near from now, you have this really cool thing called the June Intelligent Oven, but I don't think, at least in the next couple of years, that's a mass market product, and nor I do, think, do I think you think that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but how, how soon will some of these things you guys are building in, like, like a camera in your oven, will that be like a, like a 25 to 50% penetration? How, or does it ever get there? Is that, is that an inch? Well, <clears throat> when you look at... Um, there was this recent article about how the cost of technology goes down every year, with one exception, which is your Comcast bill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it, it's very true. Like, when you go back, the first Mac was $8,000. Yeah. Um, the first computers were the size of this hall. They needed air conditioning. They needed, like, an army of men to change vacuum tubes every day to keep them going. So technology itself gets cost reduced year over year, right? So um, some of these technologies right now, like high-end ARM SOCs with GPUs running general purpose GPU computing languages, running real-time machine learning, computer vision, all this stuff will become accessible. Um, and you just have to look at your pocket, see what's in your pocket. And what I carry in my phone is actually more powerful than the desktop PC I used to have in college. Like, which just blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and so technology over time will become more accessible. And it's our job right now to make sure we're building the right platforms, the right cloud infrastructure to learn from the data that we collect over time and make that more effective. So Moore's Law is universal even in the kitchen. And we're going to see some of the things you're doing universally applied. Prices are going to come down as we go down the cost curve. Dan, are you seeing that? Um, I mean, you guys are early in the stage of, of adding and kind of uh, evangelizing RF cooking in the way you guys are doing it. Um, but when you talk into your potential partners and building this into stoves, I imagine they have certain price points because they want to hit certain margins. Um, talk about that. Are, are we, the first year or two, is this going to be like a, a premium product we you guys are doing? Or, and maybe five years from now, this is like in every, every home? How are you guys envisioning it? I think we envision much the same as what uh, Nikhil was uh, intimating around uh, the introduction of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a product, a hardware product, in this case, you know, I think married with um, software services or uh, you know, uh, uh, delivery-based services or, or other forms of services. Um, but the, the, the product itself that someone would pr procure and bring home, uh, number one, uh, what we advocate is that it be um, a countertop in nature and you're not tied to the, uh, you know, your kitchen refurbishment or building a new home or, or any of those other um, long, long cycle dynamics. Um, the second thing that we advocate for is that we, uh, that the, 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 our customer, the people who are gonna create a, a product that, you know, any of us might, uh, might purchase, really understand the use case and what they're bringing that's of, of value. 
Um, at the end of the day, you know, and we can try it out, we can, you know, we're all kind of uh, technology uh, geeks of a certain uh, uh, type up here, and we can try it out numerous examples of the introduction of new technology and how much higher the price points were at introduction, even though there were alternatives in the market to what uh, was being offered, yet inevitably people saw utility that was worth the difference in price that they were willing to step forward and put their dollars, uh, you know, on the table, so to speak, uh, to to experience that uh, that advantage, whatever that advantage may be. And we think that in the kitchen space or in the cooking space, that those advantages are actually quite numerous. Many of which are in the actual appliance itself, with regards to how well it does its job in, in cooking the food. In, in our case, uh, many of which are uh, lie within this ecosystem that both Nikhil and I are trying to. Uh, you know, advance the cause of here because it's it's not an island in that it's just a uh, uh, an unintelligent box that you operate with your intelligence of how much time at what temperature based on the ingredients and the quantity of the food that you're putting in. It's actually a very intelligent uh, adaptive device in its own right that fits in an ecosystem uh, or a supply chain uh, of, of sorts that is dependent on the other elements to help uh, help it deliver its value. So, you know, we talk about um, these uh, on-demand services. Uh, there's a number of different talks and topics and people, you know, here in the audience that represent some of those companies, uh, whether it's um, you know, the delivery of fresh produce uh, uh, from a supermarket or from a company such as Amazon or if it's uh, one of the boxed meal services, for instance. Um, but, you know, today in, uh, in our world, I think where we see uh, another point of common ground is that the cooking appliance actually um, has the opportunity to fill a very critical gap in that entire, in the, in the continuum of that supply chain, and that by having an intelligent and connected cooking appliance, you have the opportunity to put an endpoint on the journey of that food to the point of consumption. And that's a tremendously powerful potential outcome that has many, many derivative effects, not just on the entirety of the supply chain, uh, but also on things that are as personal as your, you know, your health or my health. We've heard the analogy a couple times today, uh, a GPS is a good analogy for cooking, right? Um, but we all know when we apply that to cars, it's, it's kind of the first step towards self-driving cars. Like if we look at the spectrum, we, we have GPS, we have a little more automation, we have more sensors, eventually we get to the point where the car, we just lay back and sleep as the car drives us to work. And, but I, I want to understand in terms of automation as it applies to food, we're kind of in that stage where we're talking about the GPS, but there are some startups doing essentially cooking robots at this point. I think at least at some level, Nikhil, you're kind of going down that path. It, it knows it's cookies and maybe it, it programs it for you. But so Inder and I want to ask you, I mean, do we get to that point, and, and as we think about full cooking automation, the cooking robot, is this something that you think the consumer wants, or at least maybe some consumers want? It's an evolution. It's, a, it's definitely an evolution. I think we have seen, um, you know, um, a point of time now where we go and buy uh, frozen pizzas and bring it and bake it in our oven, and precisely it cooks exactly as you have get it from the, um, get it if I had made it myself at home, which I don't make always, but I do sometimes. Um, but essentially the point is that some of these things uh, probably will take time. And it's again a lifestyle choice when people want to do something either uh, because they want to do it for fun or they are trying to do it because of lack of time and their, their work life basically needs to be balanced in a way where it needs to be done. And I think that's where a lot of the concepts need to move into mainstream. So what we are seeing is that a lot of the concepts that are coming out, whether cooking robot or uh, in the realm of, let's say, 3D printing, we talked about some of those things earlier about, you know, uh, would that get into our kitchen on a regular basis? Probably it will take over a period of time. Um, but we do see that certain areas where virtual assistants will start playing a significant role in telling us how to do certain things better. And it again becomes a social experience. Essentially, I could actually hire a chef who will take me through in a video way on how I am cooking. The cooking surface itself will tell me whether uh, the cooking vessel is rightly heated up or not, or whether it is at a certain point of temperature that I need to do this or stop and do something else. So we see that as the first evolution before it gets to a point where it is an automated cooking process and things like that. Maybe in another you know, uh, 
couple of decades we probably will have when we put you know things in one end and other end yeah, and comes yeah. out completely cooked. Nikhil, you guys, what's the end game when you you plan it out? Are you gonna ten years from now? Do we have the the June intelligent robot cooking robot? I mean, where's it gonna go? What's the end game? Well, you have to step back and see what is the motivation behind cooking at home, right? Um, the first main thing is you want to take charge of your nutrition. Right, uh, and people need to balance preparing food with their busy lives. So there is a place for automation. Right, automation has the benefit of saving you time, uh, opening up time or mind cycles to do other things, and also it prevents human mistakes. So one of the things I struggled personally with doing, let's say, a, a chicken breast on a stovetop, is I'm cutting into it. I'm looking for pink. And I'm worried about killing my or food poisoning my family. <laughs> yeah. um, but when you do that with a, even with just a temperature probe, that becomes less, ang it's less anxiety to deal with. Um, so I, there is definitely a place for automating as much as you can and letting technology do things better, um, which a human would probably make a mistake at. Um, for us, the end game is to reduce friction from start to finish when you want to cook, thereby helping you feel more confident, feel more accomplished, and feel less anxious, and improving your general quality of life. So that's the end game for us. I think on our call, Dan, you talked a little bit about how you think this technology can be applied to uh, Help us eat better, and it kind of it, it's it, there's a trend, uh, a macro trend about how people just want to know where their food's coming from, want to eat better, and ap applying technology to that is like a big deal. So, talk a little bit about your thoughts there, maybe some of the technologies you see that could do that. Okay, well, again, I'm going to kind of start from the supply chain point of view, which is um, um, uh, you know the, the, the dynamic that you're pointing out is the the trend and is observable in a lot of different um, ways uh, of people's desire, preference, and in fact, in many cases, needs to eat, to eat healthier, to improve their uh, their quality of life uh, through their um, you know taking care of themselves. And the food that you eat is you know by by and large the single largest determinant of that outcome, more much more so than than exercise, for instance, or any other. Um, uh, behaviors or activities that, that, that you take part in. But, you know, there's, there's a couple big dynamics that are taking place, you know, industry-wide here. I'll start with those, and that has to do with the food delivery. And food delivery is oftentimes uh, promoted uh, as um, uh, being sourced uh, more, uh, with more fresh ingredients and being a more direct uh, route from, you know, farm to table. Um, so if you just, you know, accept that premise, then number one, you're getting ingredients that are fresher and presumably more healthy. Um, but I also think that, you know, when the food comes into the home, you have to do something with it. And this is where, you know, we're all sort of, um, you know, investing our time and our, and our energies is to make an appliance or provide the tools and the capabilities for appliances to be designed and to be built that uh, take those uh, food items in and uh, make sure that they're cooked with uh, the best capabilities that the appliance can can provide, and we think that you can accomplish this by using modern, you know, computing and algorithms and uh, and data science types of techniques. Whether you call it machine learning or robotics or automation, uh, all of those labels can apply, you know, um, uh, as and when appropriate. But the end objective there is to make sure that you're not overcooking something and to cook something to its Let's call it its optimum healthy healthy state as it's intended by the by the recipe and the ingredients that are that are in it, and by doing so, then you're giving the person that's going to consume it the best opportunity to convert that you know food into uh, into a healthy result. One of the things I th I think we've heard uh, talk about is this, as we talk about this analogy of the, the food factory is kind of the just in time delivery system. This old business school people remember just in time delivery is like as you need it, it comes. And as we think about meal services like Blue Apron and Plato, I'd be kind of interested for you to game out a little bit and I'll, I'll put you on the hot seat and I was like, are we getting to the point where we'll have like kind of the food delivery drone from Amazon as I think about <laughs> what I want for dinner and it shows up? I mean, how, 
How compact can you get that delivery system tailored towards what that meal is going to be tonight? And what are some of the technologies that you Actually, see? Actually, it's, uh, it's already happening. I think there are uh, multiple levels of it. One is uh, food ultimately is a chemistry. It's basically bringing together uh, different elements together in a particular way that gives us the taste and the flavor and the look and the feel of it and everything that we enjoy about it. Uh, at the other level, when you think of it, is that how it can be delivered in a way that is uh, appealing, it doesn't uh, go uh, bad, it is actually maintaining that same quality and other things. So there are technologies in terms of the packaging quality and all of those things will start playing a role. And what we are already seeing is that uh, some of the uh, restaurants, um, at least I know a few of them in San Francisco where they actually start, uh, if you order some very specific kind of food, they will provide them as separate pre-cooked in certain portions. When you bring back home, you they have the instructions on bringing them together and it will actually be looking exactly the way how you would have ordered it in a restaurant. Now, it's the experience versus, you know, if you had ordered the same food, it comes in a package and you're heating up in the microwave, it's not the same thing. It's two different things. And I think that's the appealing part of it, how it does. Now, how can you get it done quicker, bring it go quicker to a particular person? Um, I know there are a couple of uh, startups in San Francisco that mm -hmm. are delivering food to the door within a particular time frame. Exactly that's the way the chef prepared food. Um, and that can, today is basically using the mechanism of the courier service that comes and delivers in a prepackaged box. Can it be another mechanism? Absolutely, yes. I mean, as things work up, work out in terms of the delivery yep. mechanism, it yep. should work out. I, uh, I was talking before I went up that I was going to do my Phil Donahue impression and go out in the audience and see who asks, wants some questions. So I, I remember I wanted to do that. So does anyone have any questions? that they want to ask these, these super smart technologists. I'm going to come down. I might have to force some of you guys. So. Do you have any questions? You want to ask a question on this? No? Do I want to ask a question? Yes, I do. Oh, yes, okay. yeah. Oh, OK. Are you OK? <laughs> so I. Oh, uh, testing. Oh, there it is. My mouth needs to get closer. So thank you for your answers this afternoon. I appreciate them. Can you help explain if you recognize early on that the adoption of the technologies that you see coming out for the initial high end versions that might not have mass markets in mind, but will pave the way for lower costs with higher volumes over time. What do you find to be the biggest challenge in communicating to your consumers? What, how, do you, how do you get those first early adopters to bite so that you can start that snowball effect happening? So the way to think about a new product coming in, I think the most critical thing is to communicate the, the value proposition that comes with it. There will always be a certain segment of the market which is willing to take the value prop and pay the price for the first gen. There's early adopters in every segment of the market. Um, and over time, the, the idea is you don't have to sell the premium product to everyone. You just have to sell enough to make or pave the way for the second generation and the third generation. Um, so I think making a clear value proposition and then going down market from there is a proven and viable strategy. I think there's other dynamics that then feed into that, which has to do with um, you know, the competition amongst the various parties that are uh, say invested in that space and we've seen this you know time and time again the most uh, most i think recent example that uh, i think is compelling and comes to mind is in flat screen tvs um you know flat, flat screen tvs came out and they were you know thousands of dollars for you know relatively small uh, televisions by our standards now today uh, but at the time um you know we're competing on a, a quite a su su substantial um price premium relative to what was available from a a picture tube uh, form of the form of the appliance. And it was some of those newer companies that came in with uh, flat screen TVs, LCD technology, and, and what have you, uh, that got those early adopters. And then the larger uh, companies that were, you know, very strongly invested in the picture tube uh, part of the market 
decided they had to they had to move. They either had to invest and, and invest for scale, or they eventually ended up exiting the market. And even those that did invest for scale, for scale in some cases, you know, made made a, a bet too late. And so, <clears throat> I think you also tend to see this uh, sort of the second wave dynamic that happens. I don't know if it's the second or the third, but you know, in relatively close uh, proximity to that early adopter phase, you get the larger guys that are, have had the proposition validated for them and they can find they can you know define the path for their own you know a cost structure to fit their economic model for being able to enter into production and provide those sorts of uh, products to the market on a much broader scale yeah, quick, quick follow up you know, I, yeah, so uh, one of the challenges with the yeah, TV and the, and the TV would come out today VC say, well, what problem does this solve? Well, it makes fat TV skinny, really, is the problem that it's solved, right? But what are the, how do you take that first adopter position and apply it to what problem does this first adopter technology solve? Another audience, so what, what, what is the, how do you address that in terms of the dynamic of the first adopter? Uh, I'll start off and I'll, I'll let these gentlemen jump in, but I, I think we're all of the same mind that what we're after is we're trying to drive a higher quality result in terms of nutritional uh, components of the food that we're trying to cook for the consumer uh, and an increase or an improvement in the quality of life and that quality of life component comes through a variety of different um, forms not the least of which is convenience and so we're all in a very you know driven uh, society certainly in the developed countries and in developing countries it's it's really you know not much different you have uh, you know very large urbanized areas that are becoming increasingly urbanized and continue to grow and, and, and aggregate uh, people and therefore make it economically viable to provide services in support of the sorts of uh, convenience uh, items that we've been talking about here with regards to food delivery and on-demand services, et cetera. So I think we're driving to try to provide a value proposition that says, I can provide you uh, food that is of higher quality than what you might ordinarily uh, be able to get in a manner which is convenient and fits your particular version of, of, of a lifestyle. So in addition to just the convenience aspect, there is, um, it, it's a better tool, right? End of the day, the better your tool, the better your results will be. And as your results get more predictable and repeatable, um, the experience gets better. So it's, the value proposition is it's not just another appliance, it's an appliance that does the old job but in a much better fashion, thereby improving a quality of life. Um, also part of uh, your, the question that you asked was, um, is to do with the consumers themselves because the, uh, any technology that is uh, considered as disruptive is when consumers view it the way how it impacts their own lifestyle, right, to some extent. Uh, one of the biggest shift that has taken place in the consumer world is the, uh, I mean, taking the same example of that you talked about in the uh, flat screen TV, uh, flat screen TV is basically delivering a set of content. That same content can now be seen across many different devices and that flat screen is not that important per se. And that decision was primarily driven by the consumers on the way how they actually approach looking at that. Kitchen as such is a very, uh, very much of a very different kind of environment where consumers define their own space on what they eat, how they eat, and their own lifestyle part of it. And so there is going to be enough audience out there who would be looking for that next step, what it means, compared to the first generation of an oven or a refrigerator that they had bought. And so that is a significant shift in the mindset of the consumers that is also taking place and driving a lot of these changes out there. Internal, Dan, and Nikhil, despite my very poor Phil Donahue impression, you guys are fantastic. Give these guys a round of applause. And uh, we'll welcome to